these substitutes may actually contribute to increased overall meat consumption <laughs> as these meat-based companies use that added capital to grow and expand. Hi, my name is Juliana Roth, and this is Conversations with Animals. Cool, yeah. So uh, I'm an assistant professor of sociology at Colorado State University Pueblo, um, and I teach courses on like environmental sociology, um, trying to bring in uh, animal type courses as well. I taught uh, one. Uh, recently on uh, One Welfare, which is about how uh, human, animal, and environmental uh, well-being are all interconnected. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's me in a, a nutshell. Um, and uh, for me, the, the background with veganism and uh, or, or that interest in animals, I guess, uh, is uh, connected with sociology because I uh, decided to try being vegan uh, the first year of my uh, undergrad, uh, and I was like shocked at all the responses that I got from people about that decision that I kind of viewed as a personal like dietary <laughs> choice, but people were like, you know, relating it to gender, like men eat meat, uh, and to <laughs> nationalism, like it's American to eat meat, and to religion, God made animals for us to eat. And so that got me really thinking about a lot of these concepts in sociology, how how those influence our individual uh, behaviors and attitudes, and so. Great, yeah, and um, yeah, because it it seems like you did most of your education and in, in like Colorado, Utah, um, and Idaho as well, maybe. Yep. Um, so I just as an outsider, I do feel like those are in particular places where there's very rigid yeah. <laughs> norm <laughs> for gender um, and for mm -hmm. food um, and religion, everything. So yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, but what was were you able to find like alliances within your academic circles or did you feel like there was also a resistance to including animals as significant for these topics? Um, well, so during my whole, uh, undergrad, I didn't even like realize that, um, animals could be something that sociologists studied. Um, when it was only once I started doing my master's that, uh, my advisor was like, Hey, there's actually like this whole field of study, like, uh, and he mentioned environmental sociology, um, and so I didn't even realize that, you know, there was a, even a, its own subcategory of like society and animals. Um, and, and so it wasn't even really until kind of the tail end of my master's and my um, a PhD that I really got into questions about like uh, animals. And, and sometimes there was like pushback. <laughs> um, I, I remember like uh, so I did my dissertation on uh, dairy farmers and like the role that technology uh, plays in their relationship with their cows. And my committee was like very worried about how a vegan could like be studying this. They're like, you got too many biases and stuff. Um, but <laughs> everybody has biases um, related to that. And, you know, how am I more biased than someone who's like, drinking milk um, or like <laughs> participating in the industry um, so yeah no disruptors allowed <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, do you feel like in sociology in general the animals are studied as like um, extensions of humans so either as a pet or as a food source um, are they framed in that way or do you see models for like looking at animals as sort of independent or um maybe more interconnected rather than like uh yeah as an extension of the human counterpart yeah i think uh the both um and maybe the, like as animals became 
uh, like objects of study in sociology, it maybe started off a little bit more in that extension way. Like, look, you study the family and animals are kind of like extensions of your family um, when they're pets. Um, but I think, yeah, it's definitely uh, uh, that kind of more critical view, um, uh, thinking of animals as independent beings has definitely like taken a, a stronger hold, I think, in sociology. Great. Um, and in terms of like the environmental research, I know you did a lot of work um, doing research in like the the river, the Columbia River Basin. Um, and were you finding um, impacts on like the different non-human species there? Or were you kind of looking at it more um, in terms of like how it affects the, the populations in Pacific Northwest? Yeah, so um, in that research, um, I was part of a big like interdisciplinary team looking at the connections of uh, food, uh, energy, and uh, water. And, and so with that, I kind of did uh, go that dairy route, talking to um, the the dairy farmers about how technology impacts their like relationship with their uh, cows. Uh, but we also uh, talked with like um, different types of resource managers uh, in that area um, about like who they consider stakeholders. And, and one of the things that came out of that was uh, that the people managing resources uh, do think about animals and the environment as uh, stakeholders. Um, so it's not just you know about like the bottom line for a lot of these uh, managers. They're they're thinking about uh, th these other groups when they're making decisions. Great. Um, what was it like to to speak with farmers about their the way that they interact with animals? Were they open to discussing it, or did it feel <laughs> like <laughs> afraid to be seen? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So that was one of the challenges. Is uh, I, I didn't want to, uh, be like dishonest, uh, but I guess I didn't like volunteer, <laughs> but, <laughs> Hey, I'm vegan. Um, but even just mentioning that I'm a sociologist, like put up some guards for people. So I, uh, my dissertation was focused on, uh, dairy farmers in, uh, Washington, but, I was doing my PhD in Utah, so I was like going to visit the um, dairies around there to kind of, you know, kind of do some of that pre-research uh, work. And uh, so when I would like call them up, I'd say like, I'm interested in coming and visiting the dairy. I'm a student at Utah State University. And they're like, cool, great. You're like studying agriculture. I'm like, no, I'm studying sociology. <laughs> <laughs> and they'd be like, uh, I don't think this is not going to work out. Like you can't mm -hmm. come visit. <laughs> um, and wow. so, yeah, a, a couple of people did, um, let me, uh, come and visit. And, y you know, even though I was coming at it as a vegan, I still am like interested in, uh, farmers and cows living the best life possible. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I know that's like a, a hot topic in like animal welfare and animal liberation, right? Should we like be improving the lives of animals on yeah. farms? And I guess I'm kind of of the mindset that people are going to continue to do this. And so it's best to try and improve their welfare as much as we can. Um, yeah. While also still working <laughs> for like animal liberation, um, but recognizing that that might not, that, you know, that's going to take time. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, what do we do in that transitional period? Um, there won't be like this overnight change. So I think it's really interesting for you to do that work and think about um, what, what is going on now. So was there, are there openness within the farmers to improving the conditions or is it, I know you said not all of them were about the bottom line. So I'm just curious to hear more about that. Yeah. Um, well, that's kind of one of the 
one of the interesting things that came out in the interviews that maybe like relates in some ways to this like future mm -hmm. research on like paradoxes is <laughs> I talked to one farmer who was like started crying when they were telling me about a cow who got like sick and died um and so it's like yeah almost paradoxical where you're like raising cows to be milked but then also to be slaughtered mm -hmm. um but then also feeling like really attached to them and crying when when they do die um uh but the the specific question i was looking at was like the role of technology and like building relationships or, or kind of facilitating relationships between farmers and their cows and I thought that technology was like maybe driving them apart mm -hmm. you know um, automatic milking machines and things like that kind of turning the farm into a factory mm -hmm. um, which it is <laughs> but, <laughs> but also <laughs> but the results from the farmers was kind of unexpected where uh, they actually uh, reported feeling closer to their cows when they did have more of these technologies like automatic milkers. And so I uh, interviewed them and kind of like asked why that was the case after surveying them. And it, it turns out <laughs> they don't like milking the cows. The cows don't like being milked by them. <laughs> and so having a, this technology kind of do that uh, unpleasant job, let them have more time to do what they wanted with the cows, you know, spend time in non-stressful ways with them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Um, and from there, did you realize like you wanted to continue focusing on animals, um, or are there other things in between that brought you to the research that you're doing today? Uh, yeah, I think I've uh, always um, wanted to uh, focus on animals since I discovered that that was like <laughs> yeah. a, a viable uh, path within uh, sociology. Uh, but uh, animals are like kind of embedded in all parts of society. And so uh, I, I say I, that I'm an environmental sociologist who studies animals. So the, the types of questions I ask and the way that I study it is very much like an environmental sociologist would. Um, mm -hmm. And, and yeah. I guess my other research is still pretty heavily embedded in environmental sociology. Yeah, wonderful. Um, so I was wondering if we could talk about, so the article I found you through the meatless menu paradox. So um, could you, for those who haven't read it yet or just want to learn more, can you explain what this is? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so I guess that's a good uh, segue uh, talking about like an environmental sociologist approaching animal issues um, because there's these two environmental paradoxes, uh, the Jevons paradox and the paperless office paradox uh, that are basically warnings about uh, the, the relationship between technology and the environment. So the Jevons paradox uh, is this idea that increased efficiency uh, can lead to increased use of a resource. So uh, th this old researcher in the 1800s, William Stanley Jevons, was looking at coal usage and saw that as coal-like powered machines became more efficient, they used more coal as a society. Um, and the easiest way to like illustrate this in modern life is like with cars, I think, um, because we we're, we're like often working to uh make cars more efficient right higher miles per gallon and stuff like that um but as we make cars more efficient people change their other habits um so you drive more often you um choose to live farther away from your job you um <laughs> make bigger <laughs> cars and trucks and things like that so that those gains in efficiency with like engines are kind of canceled out um, and so uh, efficiency is good and it's like something we should strive for, um, but it can also kind of have this paradoxical effect that where it increases uh, yeah. resource usage. Um, and then the second one is the paperless office paradox, which is kind of related, but it's more about uh, displacement instead of efficiency. So in like this uh, 70s and 80s, 
uh, computer technology was introduced into offices. And they're like, wow, this is great. We're going to like replace paper. Um, we can do it all on the computer now, which will be good for the environment. We have less trees to cut down. Um, but what happened is uh, paper usage skyrocketed. Um, and the reason for that is, yes, the computer replaced some technology, but also like facilitated <laughs> a, a lot of <laughs> like paper usage. So uh, people were like, had access to all these files that were hard to get before, right? And so suddenly they could each print them out instead of having to go uh, somewhere to get them. Uh, printing out emails, uh, just easier to print. Uh, and mm -hmm. so uh, the paper usage actually uh, increased uh, during that time period and kind of continued until just very recently where it's kind of started to plateau and maybe decline in a few places. So, mm -hmm. okay, wow. so that brings yeah. us to the meatless <laughs> menu paradox. Yes. <laughs> which it's uh, looking at uh, all these plant-based substitutes that uh, companies have started to roll out, uh, and in particular, kind of meat-based companies and fast food chains. So uh, one of the first ones was like Carl's Jr. with their um, Beyond Burger. Uh, uh, but Burger King has like the Impossible Whopper. Uh, KFC dabbled in their like plant-based chicken for a while. A, a lot of fast food has like done this. Um, and so some people like look at that and they're like, that's great. It's like signs of a changing society. Um, and maybe it'll convince more people to adopt the plant-based diet. But these paradoxes are kind of like a warning about this where, um, these substitutes may actually contribute to increased overall meat consumption <laughs> as these meat-based companies use that added capital to grow and expand. So in the United States, we've kind of like reached the limit <laughs> in terms of meat consumption. We're like eating it for every meal. It's like, there's not a lot of room to add meat <laughs> to our diet. Um, but uh, globally, there's a lot of countries where meat consumption has been historically low and is now starting to rise. And that's where a lot of these companies are looking to expand. There's there's like not a lot more room for McDonald's in the United <laughs> States. And I think it, it's even uh, decreased uh, in the past like decade. Um, but it's increased globally and they have like plans to continue to expand. So the meatless menu par paradox is basically saying like, they're just trying to capture another market, right? Mm -hmm. That's what they do. And so by giving money to these meat-based corporations, that, that could actually fuel uh, the global meat consumption. Uh, even if looking at like maybe the smaller scale, a few people do transition away within the United States, the, the, the global picture will be uh, more meat consumption, more animal suffering. Yeah. So do you think there is room for like a totally plant-based fast food company to take over or should we be moving away in general from like thinking that a corporation is going to save us? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, that's, that's a tough question, right? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and uh, well, I mean, it kind of harkens back to that, like, uh, question of, like, welfare versus liberation. Like, should we be embracing these small uh, steps, or should we be, like, demanding more? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if I have the answer, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, it, it's a hard one. Um, are there more like community like um, I guess if you were to meet somebody who was curious about transitioning their diet um, like mm -hmm. what would you recommend in terms of just like at home steps or maybe like community or local based steps for them to do 
Um, well, yeah, I guess first thing I would like, uh, I would suggest like trying some of the um, meat alternatives, right? That's probably the easiest uh, way. <laughs> and in blind taste tests, people do rate the impossible uh, beef as higher than like uh, cow beef. Um, uh, but, but also maybe just like, uh, take a look at their diet and how much of it is already, um, plant-based, uh, cause we, we like, I'm trying to think of the joke. It's like, Hey, try this apple. And then they like take a bite and you're like, that's a vegan apple. And they're like, Oh, I thought it tasted strange. <laughs> you know, it's like, a lot of people are already eating plants and vegan food. Um, mm -hmm. and uh, in in my opinion, that like added animal product is usually a small part of it. Um, and so I don't know, taking that out um, feels big, but but once you do it, it's it's not as big as it yeah. seems. Yeah, I always think it's funny. Um, I say to someone that Oreos are vegan or like Junior Mints. And I'm like, yeah. I know this is still the issue of like, it's a huge company making it. Um mm -hmm. But I think it always does surprise people that they're like, wait, what? I thought it had to be like salads. And <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a great approach of just, um, yeah, showing that we don't need things, especially like an ingredient like gelatin or something with, where I'm like, why does this even exist? Yeah. <laughs> Nobody wants to eat this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's like yeah. the other classic joke where like, you pick up like a, a piece of broccoli and it has like ingredients, 99% broccoli, 1% milk powder. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why is milk powder in everything? I but. know. Yeah. It's, it's just one of those like sinister deals that have been made. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Even in crouton, sometimes I find it and I'm like, this crouton doesn't even have like a flavor <laughs> to it. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. So, so with the meatless menu paradox though, um, what, what do you suggest as our way out of it? Or is it something that we cannot escape hence being a paradox? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think it probably will require structural changes. I guess that's what I come back to always as like a sociologist, like individual behavior, definitely people should do it. But there's things built into our system that um, just uh, like drive th these broader trends. And, and so like one of those is um, meat subsidies. Um, as long as corporations can continue to make profits from selling meat, they're going to do it. But uh, uh, those profits right now are like held up by governments subsidies um uh the like true cost of a hamburger is something like twenty dollars i don't know the exact number but um it's like way higher than than what they're able to charge for it with those subsidies so shifting those from uh animal products to uh plant products would make a huge difference and for those individual choices then that follow from that, th that's another um, huge thing. Um, because for a lot of people, that money is the the bottom line about which product they're going to, to choose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's definitely something that comes up to beyond just the taste or options is like thinking that it's unaffordable or um, and like you're saying, even threatening livelihood for people like the farmers, like those are two really difficult things to to talk through. Yeah. And, and that's a, another area that I'd like to maybe like expand into with my research as, um, you know, that environmental sociology, applying it to animals, the, the just transition has focused on like um, fossil fuel industries, how they transition from coal and oil to renewable energy and how we take care of like the workers in those industries while making that transition. Mm -hmm. And I think that well, we can have that same conversation about like uh, farmers working with animals, right? How can they transition 
um, from from that to uh, farming plants or mushrooms or whatever it is and not just be you know left behind to fend for themselves yeah wonderful well I feel like that's a good place to end like looking forward and into future research um, is there anything else you want to share with folks before you go or best ways to stay in touch with you uh, if if people want to learn more um uh I have my <laughs> website and my Google Scholar page. <laughs> yeah. um, I guess that's the the best way to keep up with what I'm up to. So, uh, but yeah, anyone's uh, free to reach out and emails anytime. So, great, awesome. Well, thank you so much for being here, and I'll talk more soon. Thank you so much for listening. Make sure that you join us on Substack at animal.julianaroff.com where you can sign up for a newsletter where you get extra bonus doodles and different movement practices and other ways to relate to the non-human animals in our lives.